Welcome back. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the last speaker of this uh, workshop. It's Giovanni Tonon from Milan, who is the director of the Center for Translate Omic Science. We just changed name. We just changed name. Okay, who's, who's the director in Milan? And uh, we introduced Giovanni yesterday over dinner to um, the globe. <laughs> exactly. The box. So I rehearsed all night, and but it okay. really went very far. <laughs> And he promised to practice the whole night. <laughs> and I almost did, uh -huh. except nine hours of sleep. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to the rhetorical <laughs> highlight of the meeting. meeting. OK. So thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I mean, without knowing it in advance, I'm going to touch base on many of the topics that have been touched so far. And uh, one of them, the first one, is going to be actually uh, precision medicine slash uh, uh, targeted therapies. And as you know, it's very, very fashionable in these days. This is actually the Obama administration precision medicine initiative, was followed up by several others throughout the world, not only so in the US, but throughout the world. However, the precision medicine paradigm as a molecular targeted therapy uh, as well, as was pointed out this morning, does have several drawbacks, uh, se several really issues and problems. The first one well, actually was raised uh, more than uh, 10 years ago by Beth Borgeson Group, suggesting that indeed when you do uh, sequencing, you actually end up having the usual suspects there. And there are tons really of small hills, as they call it, and there's really no mantis but hills, or uh, mutations that are really affecting only a few patients or even one patient at all. And of course, you cannot uh, raise targeted therapies against all of them because it would be, from an economical point, standpoint, a really huge, uh, complicated mess. So this is actually the first point. And actually, Bert Vogelson, if you are interested, she just published a review in Nature Reviews of Cancer, suggesting that we shouldn't really bother at all about uh, heterogeneity, because if you go after these guys here, you're all set and nice, and you uh, have solved all your problems. You are more than uh, invited to, to read this. So the answer that as a geneticist we always had is that, OK, forget about the little hills. We go after pathways. But again, and this is actually again a work by uh, Bert Vogelstein, if you look at pancreatic cancers, uh, all the pathways are, are somehow altered in a single tumor in a patient. You see that actually pretty much everything is covered, many, many, many pathways. So if you want to tackle each pathway using drugs, you really end up not being actually personalized anymore in a way. And second, of course, the toxicity level of this drug with the therapy of everything is really going to be very, very toxic for the patient. So again, the idea of personalized medicine going after all these genes, again, it does show some problems here as well. Um, we heard this morning the concept of oncogene addiction. So basically the idea is that you have an oncogene mutated, for example, you give a drug against that oncogene and somehow the tumor disappears. Again, this is a concept that was born in a rough in 2000 by Weinstein. Uh, the problem is that it was raised many years ago by Anton Burns at the NKI, is that the concept of oncogene addiction has really to do with mouse modeling. So if you take a mouse and you put KRAS inside, and then you turn off KRAS, for sure the tumors will shrink. In humans, it doesn't really work that way, especially in solid tumors. It's really very difficult or fairly difficult to really find a nice oncogene addiction that is going to work 100% of the time without inducing resistance very, very soon after you give the drug. So again, also the concept of oncogene addiction needs to be somehow tempered by the fact that it really doesn't probably exist in epithelial cancers. And finally, in terms of uh, uh, plasticity, also this is a concept that was raised this morning. The plasticity concept, this is actually, again, papers fairly uh, old in, in that regard. But if you block, for example, CMET, or if you block EGFR, it is all a net of different other players that can actually take the place and resubstitute the gene of the protein that you are blocking. And so again, it's very, very difficult to really block a pathway and to try to obtain a response. And this is actually what has been shown again, that probably tumors work on this concept here. You have, a, you have a, a, a signal in some way, you have several transducers. Even if you block one transducer, you have other transducers that can easily take over and somehow get the tumor cell to survive. So the concept of targeted therapy is probably not entirely flawed, but definitely very, very problematic in a, in a concept. And this is actually a point that's been raised by uh, many people around. 
uh, I'm going not to go uh, reading the whole thing here, but then uh, this is a, a strong claim against targeted therapy and precision medicine, on which the guy writing this is saying that the, uh, the community in cancer scientists are still too closely wedded to moving forward with cocktails of drugs targeted against the growth-promoting molecules of signal transduction pathways. So this is really something that should be replaced and changed. And we should really try to change uh, our paradigm since we are doing this war on cancer since 1971. And the guy saying that is James Watson in Open Biology so fairly recently. So the, the idea of uh, precision medicine and uh, more specifically targeted therapy is probably flawed. So is there anything we can do with that? Actually, I'm going to use the same slide that has been used this morning. Uh, the concept of synthetic lethality. So I think and I believe there is a, some room for targeted therapies, not when you target specifically one, uh, one um, modified or mutated gene, but more on the synthetic lethality idea. And uh, the concept actually with the same, exactly the same figures has been raised this morning already. And uh, I'm going to give you a few examples and then try to stay as far away as from wet, wet biology that I can, because I know that, I mean, I'm starting to stick with the computational side of it. So, a few slides on renal cancer. Renal cancer is really fe uh, featuring a lot of uh, chromosomal um, epigenetic and chromatin modifiers genes that are mutated and altered. And what we are finding more and more is that tumor suppressor genes uh, very often, we really stumbled upon this, but uh, of course it's not statistically relevant, but in my lab has been working on tumor suppressor genes for many years. And I would say that uh, most, if not all of them, has to do some way or the other with the genomic stability. So somehow little brothers of P53, if you wish. One of these is uh, KD KDM5, uh, a gene that is uh, not very frequent, but fairly frequently mutated in uh, renal cancer, up to 10% of patients. It does actually, by definition, modify, and I'm going to, again to be quick on this, uh, A3K4 trimethylation, so basically controlling transcription. And that's what people have been thinking a lot. But please keep in mind that also the other half of, uh, of the genome is heterochromatin, and in this case actually it's driven by modification of the A3K9 uh, residue. So what we have found in a paper published a few years ago is that uh, if you look at where jari one c localizes into the genome, it's not on, or prominently not, on A3K4 trimethylation sites where you see it's supposed to act, but most of all, and most in actually heterochromatic regions. So this is A3K9 trimethylation uh, profiles, a chip -seek. When you look at where jari one c resides, you see that actually quite neatly it overcomes and it uh, overlaps with the location that are actually heterochromatin locations. Uh, if you look through the whole, so this is actually a, a Hilbert curve, if you start from each chromosome from this side and you go down to the other end, you can see that the pattern of distribution of jari one c chromosome by chromosome is fairly overlapping with A3K9, not very, very much with the H3K4 monomethylation or trimethylation, suggesting indeed that this gene, although it is a gene targeting uh, preferentially A3K4 trim, um, trimethylation sites, actually it resides into A3K9 domains, so basically heterochromatin all, all the way through. Uh, I have several data to show, but I'm going to skip it because these are published data. Basically, when you downregulate this gene, you have uh, an increase in non-coding RNAs that triggers genomic instability. Interestingly, if you look at the TCGA data set, patients that do have mutations on jari one c show also an increase in upregulation of, of, of all long non-coding RNAs in the genome. And also, the patients affected by jari one c mutation do show an increase in genomic instability that is not present on the other tumors. Suggesting then that the, this histone demethylase is uh, involved in renal cancer, drives heterochromatin replication, and most importantly, is somehow uh, associated with genomic instability. That was somehow the point that I was trying to make before. Tumor suppressor genes oftentimes uh, have to do with genom genomic instability. Let me go down quickly to a second story concerning tumor suppressor genes that is basically the, for another disease that is called multiple myeloma. So we showed a few years ago with two papers that uh, patients with uh, multiple myeloma do present a down-regulation of YAP1 that belongs to the hippopathway. 
And uh, uh, second, we also show that the tumor cells, the my myeloma cells, do present an increase in DNA damage. So what's happening at oncogenes like MIC, for example, induce replicative stress, reactive oxygen species, increase DNA damage that would indu induce apoptosis, but then it doesn't because this pathway here is blocked. What we have shown in this paper is that if you restore YAP1 expression, or if you induce uh, replicative stress by blocking ATR, or by increasing reactive oxygen species, you are able to induce apoptosis. Uh, just focusing now on the replicative stress side, so because I want to get to the synthetic lethality part of it, when you actually use this drug in combination with the ATR inhibitor, you actually increase enormously the ability of the tumor cells to undergo apoptosis. And this is actually a drug that has been used since 1950 to treat myeloma. Before 1950, myeloma patients was really a death penalty. The patient would die in a few months. After the introduction in 1956, roughly, of the Melphalan, this is the drug, the patients were able to survive many, many months. And actually, Melphalan is still very heavily used in the clinic. And actually, what we did, that we combined Melphalan, because it's able to do cross-linking with ATR inhibitor, talking about synthetic lethality. And if you look in the mice, basically the mice don't have tumors at least at week eight after induction of other tumorogenesis. With an increase in survival, it is really very remarkable. We stopped the administration of the drug here. We haven't tested whether if you continue melphalan plus with ATR inhibitor, you can really get an increase in survival. But the major point here to bring home is that really indeed, uh, tumor suppressor genes have to do with uh, uh, genomic instability. And oftentimes, you can use already available drugs to do synthetic lethality screens exploiting these genetic lesions. And these are similar data that we got in patient samples. So, as uh, tumor suppressor genes seems to be quite relevant, we did actually NMF as well. So we took data from the TGGA and we tried to assess whether focal deletion, that are really one of the hallmarks of uh, um, tumor suppressor gene deletion, were associated with chromatin domains. And what we found using NMF was that indeed you can actually subdivide the focal deletions in the human cancer genome into four groups, four main groups. So we do have a f this first group here. I'm not going to dwell into this, but this actually here belongs most of the common tumor suppressor genes, BRCA1, P53, and many, many others. The second group here has to do with polycomb. So when you have uh, focal deletions in the polycomb, actually we found that uh, tend to localize in this region here. The number three here is uh, genes that has to do with heterochromatin regions, so affecting non-coding RNAs. But the fourth group was the most interesting one, on which when you have vocal deletions here, what's happening is a kind of a uh, funny feature. That is that while the group one, BRCA1, P16, and so on, do show down regulation of the corresponding gene, and this is fully expected, the polycon group has really no change, but with a tendency of down regulation, whereas the cluster number four, we don't have a three because it's a non-coding RNA, we are looking only into genes here, the number four has an increase uh, in uh, expression of a corresponding gene. This is really a paradox on which you have a focal deletion that actually leads not to the down-regulation of a corresponding gene, but an increase in expression of a corresponding gene. This looked like an artifact or a mystery, so we tried to find out what was happening. And actually, what's happening is that if you look at the an anatomy of these deletions, in the cluster number four, this one here with the increased expression, the deletion is rarely affecting the whole gene, but usually involves only a small portion of the gene. It looks like then that deletions in these cases are really very, very focal, below the level of the whole genome sequence. And actually, if you look then at the down regulation, you see, again, an up regulation of the corresponding gene. Uh, we try to explore some of the most typical deletions belonging to this cluster. And we choose the third most frequent, the focal deletion in the cancer genome after P10 and P16, that actually hits this gene here called CCR1. There are only three papers out there, three or four papers, describing somehow the function of this gene. So very, very little is known about CCR1. So the first consideration is that actually it's fairly um, um, frequently deleted in several cancers, up to 15% of the esophageal cancers, also other cancers as well. 
Uh, this is actually the anatomy of the deletion. As you can see, this is the whole gene. And usually, the deletion happens only in the central part of the gene, not so rarely involving the entire uh, uh, portion of the genome. Another interesting thing is that if you look at the deletion, usually affects uh, exons in this area here. And these are, of course, downregulated when compared to uh, tumors without the deletion. But the portion that is before then, that is rarely, if ever, deleted, is actually upregulated in these tumors. So these tumors do have a deletion in the central part here, but an upregulation of this portion here and also this exon here at the end. So that's really funny. And so we went on and tried to find out what was happening there. And actually, just to keep it, things a little bit short, so what we did, we found a minimal common region affecting a region between chromosome, uh, exon, sorry, exon 8 and exon 9 in intron, in this intron here. And we found here a pseudogene that was oriented on the opposite direction when compared to the uh, corresponding CCR1 gene. When we excised with uh, using um, CRISPR-Cas9 this portion here, we actually could uh, recapitulate what we see in human tumors. We do see an increase in expression in this portion here that actually was reduced on the control here. So next we ask, uh, this is related to the fact that we do have, uh, so this uh, RNA here is going up here, blocking the transcription of a gene of uh, another mechanism. So what we did, we overexpressed this uh, pseudogene here, but we didn't see any phenotype whatsoever. So CCR1 actually was not affected at all. So the gene expression was pretty much the same. So what we thought was maybe there is a local event, a chromatin-driven event, uh, happening right here that is actually driving this phenotype. So to do this, we used a, a, a CRISPR-Cas9 that was bound to KRAB using a, um, a tool that, we, that was recently published by some co-authors of the paper a few years ago. Basically, this KRAB domain blocks uh, depositing methylation uh, uh, residues, the expression of this pseudogene, blocking the expression of this level here. And indeed, somehow interestingly, we do see the same phenotype. So even if you block the expression of a pseudogene, it's enough to trigger the expression of a corresponding gene, suggesting that it's really a chromatin local based effect that is happening there. And what we believe at this point, based also on this data here, is that we do have a polymerase clashing happening in that regard. So you have a polymerase going in one direction, it is basically in this direction here for the pseudogene. A polymer is going in this direction coming from the gene. When the two polymerase clashes, you have the, both polymers uh, that are somehow going out, and so you have the blocking of the transcription of the entire gene. So we use primers here and primers here to assess this uh, hypothesis, and indeed we do see a decrease in expression in the white eye cells when this gene is there. So the polymerase goes here and then it drops and we can't detect any more of a signal of a gene downstream of the polymerase itself. So this data suggests indeed that we have an effect related to the polymerase clashing at this level. I promise that I'm not going to a lot of wet lab, uh, wet uh, biology experiments. I'm going to go fairly quickly into this. If you overexpress CCR1, is indeed oncogenic and impacts on mitosis, mitosis. If you look again in TCGA, which have uh, genes that are more, the pathways better, that separates more neatly the tumors with the deletion or without the deletion, we found that basically mitotic cell cycle genes, uh, several others involving mitosis are really indeed involved. When you look, uh, so the light doesn't really allow much, but uh, believe me, that overexpression of this uh, CCR1 induces spindle abnormalities. You have a lot of uh, funny looking cells with a lot of nuclei inside. And also, uh, again, you have uh, a passage of cells that increase that are polynucleated, uh, as uh, listed there. So basically, you have an overexpression of this gene and probably is inducing, again, chromosomal instability, as we were saying before. The mechanism in this way is actually slightly different than before. It's not anymore a tumor suppressor gene that is lost. It's somehow a dormant oncogene. You erase a little part of a gene that triggers the expression of a corresponding gene, and then by itself triggers a, a chromosomal instability, as in this case. If you look back to patients, you see actually that CCR1 deletion is associated with chromosomal instability. You have an increase in uh, signature of chromosomal instability in patients after deletion. 
and also when you uh, delete the gene, you have an increase uh, in, um, uh, of, uh, of uh, proliferation, but that you, you can bring back using a arousal kinase inhibitor. So going back to the idea before of a synthetic lethality, you can use a drug that actually affects mitosis in this case to somehow rescue the phenotype. So going back to the targeted therapy precision medicine, in this case, you can select patients with this deletion and hopefully, given an aurora kinase inhibitor, you can actually at least somehow temper the proliferation of the cells, going back to the, to the previous situation. So in the summary of this part, a large subset of deletions in the cancer genome are associated with increased gene expression. Focal deletion or an antisense pseudogene increases the expression of the corresponding gene. And if you treat the, um, these cells with aurora kinase inhibitor, you can dump this uh, increased proliferation triggered by this gene. So I try to go quickly to, through this part just because I want to get to the second part that is actually much more somehow in line with your um, expertise and I assume also your future enterprise. That is, uh, how, how should we do this? So, so we are actually... May I ask before we go to the second part yeah. about this dimensionality reduction where you find the four clusters of genes. What, what went into uh, this before dimensionality reduction? Was that... We, we selected focal deletions in the cancer genome and then we match that with uh, chromatin signatures. Usually the usual hands chromatin signatures, so enhancers, uh, transcribed genes, uh, promoters, uh, insulators, and so on. And we found actually that the, the focal deletions can be subdivided, we're actually preferentially targeting certain chromatin regions more than others. And we can actually so cluster, in a way, focal deletions based on the epigenetic portion of the genome they were targeting. Okay. So the first group, for example, was targeting genes, uh, promoters, uh, so really affecting gene expression. And indeed, when we have deletions there, we did see a decrease in expression. And here we found BRCA1, we found P16, P10, P53 itself, and so on. But the others were actually affecting chromatin regions that were really not, not related so directly to transcription. For example, in the number four, the one that I mentioned in a short example here, was enhances and pseudogenes. So, but hitting enhances, we were actually anticipating to have also an effect in expression, but decreased expression. So you, have a, you have a deletion of enhances, you would expect a decrease in, expression, a decrease in expression. Instead, we found, in general, an increase in expression. And how many features did you have before the dimensionality reduction? So if you make all these combinations? I bet I don't recall. I should, uh, I, I, will, let me, I, I will check and then get back to you. And last question yes. to your gene is CCSER1. Yes. Um, so what is expressed after the deletion? is another transcript, right? You know, or, uh, this has been shown before, actually. Uh, usually, when, even if you get this deletion, usually there tend to be in-frame deletions. So you get the expression of a functional RNA, and you get also the protein itself. I had data to show that I didn't have a time, but when you do a Western blot, you can see that even deleted isoforms, on which you miss uh, even several exons, they produce a protein anyhow. Uh, also, when you, we try to do this experiment, when you overexpress and we try to localize where the protein goes, even if it's deleted, it keeps going into the cytochrome, to the centrosome, and so on. So it doesn't really lo lose uh, its, its functionality. It remains functional, but it's increasing expression. And that's what is driven, driving the oncogenic process, we believe. And is, there, is it known whether these exon with exons which are lost, do they contribute to a functional part of the protein? So the is protein is quite mysterious because if you run, for example, searching for domains, you have usually only one domain that is fetched. I, I was actually showing you quickly, but it's a coil coil domain, but it's in the part that is usually lost. That's the only domain that is retrievable for this uh, protein. Uh, and it's lost, but nevertheless, the cell, the coil coil domain serves for uh, bringing proteins together. Even though it's lost, uh, nevertheless, uh, the protein is able to get to where it usually works. So basically, in the mitotic spindle and so on. 
that's the problem working with a gene that is so little known. There are so little information that we just try to gather what we can, but it's really not that much. In terms of domain, it's basically only that domain there that we, we, we could retrieve. Also using different tools, there's really, even if you go very deeply <laughs> trying to really find some domains uh, sh showing up, nothing popped up. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. So what's uh, the reason because targeted therapy in precision medicine in general doesn't work? And probably is uh, something that actually was shown this morning that is actually uh, the clonal evolution, evolution that is present in cancer. So the cancer is continuously evolving, and that's the reason because even if you give a drug, it's actually able to, to retrieve. So we think that we should go actually from a linear model like this one to somehow a circular model like the one of cancer evolution and try to understand cancer evolution and what we can do to prevent resistance in this context. And to this end, actually, we have set up a collaboration with Florian, also with Mel Greaves, Andrea Sottoriva, Nicola Valeri of the ICR, in Norwich, Jan Macaulay, and also in Italy. It's an accelerator grant that was awarded a few months ago to really tackle this thing, as I'm going to show you afterward and quickly. But before getting to that, let me just elaborate a little bit of a concept that was raised this morning about the idea of resistance or cancer resistance that is really not only genetic, but probably also non-genetic. So the concept of tumor resistance has actually been uh, somehow associated with the genetic business. And this was uh, somehow stemming from this wonderful paper in 1943, which is the Louis and Delbrook fluctuation test. So the idea of the fluctuation test was, let's try to understand if uh, a population of bacteria do have spontaneous mutations arising or is acquired immunity. And the bottom line is that indeed, given the distribution of mutation is probably something that is pre-existing because the, the pattern that we were able to see in terms of resistance was much more like this than like this. So if it's an acquired process, let's say non-genetic, you would have a pattern like this. But usually when you take different colonies, you get a pattern like this. So some colonies completely wiped out after treatment, and others instead showing various degrees of resistance, suggesting really there was a genetic mechanism, of course they didn't know at the time, but really underlying the resistance process. And this is actually an idea that's been carried over for decades, and also today we tend to think about cancer resistance as having a point mutation somewhere, a translocation somewhere, a genetic lesion somewhere, that is really driving the resistance mechanism. And this is something, of course, that is true in several cases, but I would argue that it's really not always the case. And actually, yes, indeed, as I was mentioning, we do have, especially on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics aspects, several mutations that may affect this pathway and actually really driving the, the phenotype. However, this is actually quite funny. In the bacteria world, basically in the same year on which the Dulia Delbrook paper was coming out, another paper came out in a completely different context in 1944, claiming that in bacteria, genetic mechanisms of resistance were really not the only story. Actually, this is, was a paper by uh, Bigger in a published in Lancet, I believe, yes, in 1944, on which basically they claim that uh, resistance, and of course this is actually additional studies made afterwards, resistance was really not the only mechanism of uh, the way by which bacteria were able to withstand antibiotic treatment. But we do have also two other phenotypes. One is tolerance, on which basically the whole population, when you hit a bacteria, the whole population is able to resist. It's not simply some, something that is really related to a few bacteria with a point mutation somewhere, but the whole population is able to withstand, at least in the initial phases, a drug treatment, and so it's able really to withstand the, 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 the treatment. This is somehow the concept of dormancy that is also present in a, in, in mammalian system. And also persistence that is very close by, uh, closely related to tolerance. So while tolerance is basically applied to the whole population, 
persistency is applied to only a subset of cells that enters in a kind of a dormant again status. When they are in this status, they are not able anymore, so they don't grow basically, but, but when you remove the drug, they start growing again. And when they start growing again, they become sensitive again. So they are really not a population, but if you give a drug again, they're going to die. They can go actually down again in this slope, become a very small population, very tiny, but genetically basically completely analogous to the other ones. So what's underlying this mechanism is probably, at least in mammalian system, related to epigenetics. So there are few observations, and naturally we will make the case that probably we are now in the position, finally, to tackle tolerance and persistence using single cell genomics. It was not possible before because you had kind of an average measure of things. Now, being able to tackle single cell, single cell aspect is really important. And uh, just to mention about the re relevance of single cell genomics, I would like to uh, point out to you this paper that is really important by Bernstein, uh, a group of Bernstein, uh, Suva, and David Ragev, on which they basically found that tumor cells in GBM are really not belonging, from a transcriptional point of view, to different classes. But they somehow fluctuate among states. So all five all tumors analyzed consist of a heterogeneous mix mixtures of individual cells corresponding to different glioblastoma subtypes. So basically, we, we were thinking before that if you take a tumor and you do gene expression profiling, it may actually may neatly fit into different groups. Instead, it looks like that uh, a tumor, if you can ever actually take a tumor in different stages, it may fluctuate between states. And the only way of seeing this is really by single cell genomics and single cell. Uh, so this is basically, so let me get now to our own project. This is the Accelerator Single Cell Cancer Evolution in the Clinic, collaboration between Milan, London, and also Norwich, and Cambridge, of course. These are the people involved. Uh, we have also companies because the aim of the project is that to bring single cell uh, genomics, study cancer evolution, microfluidics, and get into the market as quick as we can. And we are trying to tackle two major points. The first one is that uh, if a therapeutic regimen would be effective in a specific patient. And for this, we are going to use organoids, as I'm going to uh, highlight very soon. And second, uh, to define how and when resistance will develop in a way to be able to overcome it and also to anticipate it. So you have a patient, you uh, expose uh, his, uh, the cells, uh, or the organoid that cells uh, into uh, to a drug, you see how they respond, so you can give to the patient exactly the drug that they need. And we are developing together with engineers of the Polytechnical, in collaboration with the ICR, a microfluidic platform to really grow organoids and screen potentially hundreds of drugs. The idea behind it is that instead of giving a patient whatever drug is uh, somehow proposed, you first screen the drug, if you are able to do it, into a microfluidic device. You know exactly which drug probably will respond the patients to. So you can give the patient a specific drug instead of actually trying to uh, do a trial and error and see with the patient itself if it works or not. This is uh, the, the program one. And the program two instead is actually, I'm not going to talk about program three and four because they're more computation. The program three is basically what I was mentioning to you before. So trying to put together in a single cell platform, not only the classical information about resistance, so what are the genetic lesions, but we are trying also to explore the epigenetic underpinning of at the single cell level. So let me show you some preliminary data that we have gathered on the uh, single cell data and epigenetic assessment uh, on the same cells. So basically when you do epigenetic, let's call it ataxic, what you get is basically you get the sequences of the open chromatin. This is a little bit problematic if you want to do, to do epigenetic because, of course, you are missing all the closed chromatin, the heterochromatin that was mentioned to you before. So we modified the, the protocol for ATAC-SIC at the single cell level. We've been, we have been able to identify regions, and this is actually an example of our own ATAC-SIC modified pattern, on which instead of looking only at open chromatin, as it is here, we are able to fetch also closed chromatin at the single cell level. So you will get the sequences, not only of the chromatin that is open, transcriptionally active, but also of the chromatin that is closed. 
And actually, this is actually the same chip sex data from the same cells. You see, these are A3K9 signal, the one that I mentioned before. And you can see that in the same cells, we can get signals here at the single cell level that were not present here on the conventional attack seek. So we, we get basic uh, information on open chromatin and closed chromatin. As a nice, uh, if you want, uh, if you wish, uh, uh, by, by standard result of this analysis, we are able also to get much more reliable information by copy number variation, again at the single cell level, because now we are not looking only at open chromatin, but we can measure the copy number variation also in the closed chromatin. And indeed, these are data with a conventional approach. This is the new approach we are proposing. And you see that, especially when you go down with resolution, we can see a much more granular and specific patterns of copy number variation at the single cell level when compared to the conventional ataxic approach. They can only capture open chromatin. So capturing both closed chromatin and open chromatin will really increase the sensitivity of the method. The last, uh, the last, uh, yes. So, so, yeah. How do you differentiate between open and closed? Uh, what sort of coverage? So we are able to tackle, uh, to tag in a different ways uh, the open and the closed chromatin. So when you then bioinformatically you reconstruct your signals, you can actually see what is in the open and what is in the closed. Uh, and do you amplify or what sort of We don't. We don't. But I, I would say it's a big advantage because we don't need to amplify DNA. Of course, we may, we, we, we have definitely an issue because we have, we, we have a single cell level. So we are not uh, hoping to capture the entire genome. So, for example, the idea of being able also to derive uh, somatic mutations, let's put it that way, throughout the genome is not going to be feasible with this approach because, of course, we can't really get a, a, not even a 2x uh, coverage of a genome. It would be less than that because you lose stuff and so on. But at least the copy number variation, you, 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 you can uh, obtain it. So what is the coverage? Uh, we are still working on it. Uh, it's, uh, we are, I, I'm hesitant to give you an answer because we are actually twisting the, tweaking the, the, the protocol. We are trying to improve it. Uh, so it's okay so far, but we want to improve it. The, the, the copy number variation is fine. We're trying to push it as much as we can because we really like to get also somatic mutation if possible. It's not looking, uh, I mean, we, we'll see, we'll see. We're trying to push the technology as much as we can. Let me finish up now going back to the idea of uh, tolerance or non-genetic mechanism of resistance. And here we got some surprises. So there was this paper, fairly famous and important, in 2010, by Eric Lander Group, on which they basically proposed that uh, when you have a series of cell lines and you expose them to drugs, you get a little bit of percentage of cells that are persistent cells. They stay there. Uh, even if you give a drug, but at a certain point they start growing again. If you stop giving the drug, though, they become again sensitive. So it's really not a resistant, genetic resistant, but it's simply epigenetically change. So what we did basically was to apply single cell approaches to this uh, experiment to see whether we can actually identify and understand a little bit what was happening here. And we did a series of experiments, bulk ataxic, bulk RNA-seq, single cell RNA-seq in all these stages here to see what was happening to these cells. And what we found, so this is single cell, fairly simply put, uh, so these are the ones not treated, these are the ones that are treated. You can see that they are neatly distinguished, uh, and this is actually somehow expected. What was funny, though, if you look at the ataxic data, you see an amplification in chromosome 12. You can actually measure, as I was showing before, also the copy number variation. This is bulk ataxy, this is not a single cell. There was an amplification of this level here. And actually, indeed, was here. The, there was also an amplification on chromosome 15. And what we were able to see matching the sequences is actually the, the cells were developing a mini chromosome like this, on which basically the, the, two, the two portion of chromosome 12 were circularized and they were in, including also chromosome 15. And this is actually a fairly known phenomenon, it's called extra chromosomal alteration. 
what is interesting involved that the extra chromosomal alteration usually has to do with two different things. Either you have in amplification of uh, uh, oncogenes, like MYC, for example, or you do have uh, amplification of drug-resistant genes. We didn't see anything of this. And actually, what we found is that uh, if you look at the cells uh, using the rna seq data that overexpress the genes inside the mini chromosome, you do see two populations here, high level and low level amplification of these genes. But you can also see a few cells here in the pre-existing population that are probably related to the, uh, the ones that then develop into this ones here. And there was also one cell blue, so high level of amplification. So the most obvious explanation would be that in the parental cell line, you do have already some low level cells that do have already this amplification. When you give the drug, they, they become the predominant, if not the only population present. But what is funny is that instead of having the classical drug resistant genes into the mini chromosome, we do have genes belonging to mitosis, okay, but also interferon signaling. And I'm saying this because interferon signaling is relevant in this case because there were genes of interferon pathway inside the, the, the gene because when you have a chromosomal instability, you actually increase, has been recently shown by the country group and also by Kuhn group, you have an increase in inflammation. And not only that, but, and this is most important, you have also, at transient at least, an increase in immune exposure, let's put it that way. Prompting the idea that when you have this mini chromosome, at least with the interferon component inside, at least in the early phases, of the of drug treatment, you may have, uh, have uh, cell lines or cells better that are more exposed to immunotherapy treatments because they are more, they are generating inflammation and they are more exposed to the immune system. And we are, of course, uh, exploring this idea now using different organoids and other models. Yes? Are these FSM fragments replicated? We don't know. But what is remarkable, thank you for asking this, because something that really struck us is that, uh, I go back, I should have mentioned it before, if you look at the timing of the drug, so here we have still the drug, and you see that we have amplification. After a few days of suspension of the drug, the population completely disappeared, suggesting that either they really lost it, and it's something that they can actually turn on and off, or it's just a selection process. But even if it's a selection process, it's a funny one because it means that really the, the mini chromosome, it's really driving, it's really very, very detrimental for the cells. So if you don't give the drug, the cell really wants to get rid of it as quick as possible because really they don't like it, have it around. So we're now doing single cell, experiment, single clone experiment to see what's the mechanism underlying it. And do you have any evidence of horizontal gene transfer in... Between, no, we don't. Okay. We don't. This is a great point, too. In, in bacteria, it exists. Oh. In, huma, in mammalian cells, it's a little bit tricky there. It's really unclear whether cells are able to transfer. There are these piles of things like that on which, you know, that cells are connected with small channels, even mammalian cells, and they apparently connect through that or through exosomes, so that we haven't explored that as yet. Going back to the UMAP you showed in the next slide, or several slides. So do you have any sense, have you dug into those individual reads and gotten a sense of what's putting them in that group compared to the other? So some of them is related to this. So we do see as a, as a major pathways separating the two groups uh, at the cellular level, not at the um, mini chromosome level. Cell cycle and mitotic genes, uh, interferon signaling, and oxidation. This is fun the funny thing is that mitosis also comes back here to the genes residing within the mini chromosome and also in interferon signaling, suggesting that uh, at least some of the phenotypes of, uh, that we see, better seen, uh, the, of the transcriptional modification where we see, is driven by genes residing in the mini chromosome. The very last thing concerns, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. How much is known about, about uh, the 
number of all mini chromosomes that the cell has, how it's inherited? Or you know, there was, yes, there were old studies because it was something that um, uh, people doing cytogenetics have seen since the 50s or 60s. And they did a few works but back then on which basically for some, in some instances, for example, MIC, you may have hundreds of uh, thousands of mini chromosomes of MIC amplification inside the cell. And the distribution when the cells divide, it looks like mostly stochastic. So basically roughly half and half. So really no selective uh, repositioning of uh, mini chromosomes in one population versus the others. Uh, in general, it seems to be only two kinds, as I was mentioned before, either oncogenes or genes uh, involved with the, um, detoxification. What we are seeing here, and I know also other people uh, are looking into this, and there actually more and more we are finding genes has nothing to do with either oncogenes or drug resistance, but other mechanisms that probably help the cell to survive, but they're really not very much embedded on the drug-resistant paradigm as we know it. MIC is pretty special also, right? So, so Excuse me? MIC is a pretty special okay. gene, right? It's a special gene, yes. Those numbers may be... Uh, Excuse, yes, yeah, somehow peculiar for MIC, yes, yes, yeah. So, yeah, yesterday was mentioned uh, RNA velocity. We try to do, so RNA velocity basically, this is using development as uh, Jacob was saying yesterday. Uh, so you have a, this nice path of uh, genes and uh, cells belonging to the different uh, sub-portions of a, of, a, of, a, of a brain in, in the case of a, of a mouse. If you do RNA velocity, I don't go into the details how you do it, but then you get also the direction of the cells. So basically here you have a so-called stem cells and they go in all directions, so this is the center of it, and they move towards other direction. So we try to apply RNA velocity also to the single cell data that I showed you before, and we don't have any answer as it is now. We see some funny things, like this kind of a bridge that is, seems to connect these completely different populations, so that maybe, we don't really have any idea, we haven't really thought enough about this, but there may be a connection between the uh, cells that are somehow not exposed to drug and the cells that are exposed to drugs. And we do see some cells here somehow of a bridge. But also you can define with the RNA velocity which are the cells of origin on a population somehow. And what is interesting, the, the root uh, cells on the non-treated one are here. And the cells that instead are the endpoint after treatment are here. And these are the endpoints. So it looks like there is some directionality on the uh, resistant cells, on the non-resistant cells, towards the cells exposed to the drug. But we, are, we haven't really thought very deeply about this as yet. So to close this part, resistant but also persistent intolerance are probably present in cancer cells. Single cell genomics approaches uh, are used to unravel mechanisms of drug resistance. Cells with extra chromosomes are modulated in the cell population. We don't really know if it is the cell itself modulated or the mini chromosome itself that can be actually turned off or turned off, turned on. And finally, the mechanical resistance could support uh, cell cell tumor cell vulnerabilities. For the first part, I would like to thank collaborators, but of course the people in my lab and also people at the Center for Army Sciences and also within the institution and the accelerator of the part we are doing in Milan, these are the people being involved with work, and thank you very much for your attention. So we, we, we do see from the sequencing, we have, we have a look with fish, that is the classical way of looking into these things. Uh, we know from the sequencing that we do have a sequence of chromosome 12, and then se sequence of chromosome 15, and in both sides we do see chromosome 12 and 12 on the other side. So the sequencing data will suggest these are circular extra chromosomes. Just iteratively put 12 together. Could be, but we don't see the other ends though. Okay. So we think that it's really circular in a way. Mm -hmm.
question. Can you do phasing on the longer strip? That uh, you can you do phasing on the longer strip so that I mean you have short read sequencing, right? But if you have overlaps with overlaps and overlaps, yeah, we can. You can construct. A yes, you're right. We ha we haven't done it, but we could do it. You're right. We we could do it. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I did my best. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Florian. Thank you very much for a great talk.